Hey YouTube and Instagram, it's Gordon Miller. Welcome to Live at Five. Hope everybody's doing well. It looks like that's a little bit too much light on there. There, let's cut that back a little bit. That's a little better. So, uh, today, uh, we're talking about friends. Okay, so, uh, this actually came to me by uh, somebody that uh, uh, reached out via Instagram, um, and I appreciate the folks that have kind of been making the transition from uh, Instagram to, or from Quora to Instagram or YouTube and, and things like that. So <clears throat> the, um, the question was, uh, you know, look, you've talked about relationships and you've talked about, um, you know, marriage and you've talked about, you know, frankly, about sex and things like that. What about friends? And, you know, it's kind of an interesting topic. So, um, you know, I've been, uh, Sort of at a loss for topics. So if you have some topics uh, you'd like to cover, uh, please leave them in the comments or you know things like that. I'd love to uh, I'd love to get some ideas about what you'd like me to cover. Uh, otherwise, I got like nothing to say. So in the last you know week or so, uh, I've skipped a couple, and uh, you know that's because I've been busy on some other stuff as well as um, you know I just you know didn't have anything prepared. So you know I don't like to not be prepared. I don't think that's really fair to you guys. Uh, and so anyway, so today is about friends. And so I wanted to, um, you know, talk about, uh, I have, I actually made some notes today too. So, you know, I actually went down through the list and, uh, and, and so, uh, so I have a saying, uh, that I've developed over the years, uh, that says that in order to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And so I think that's one of the things that people don't really, uh, fully understand is the idea that, you know, having friends and being a friend is really kind of a two-way process or a two-way street. And a lot of folks don't really understand, uh, you know, what that's about. And I don't think people do it intentionally. So I don't think that, you know, I'm not here to say, oh yeah, there are people that suck and those people that suck are just there to take advantage of you and things like that. Is that true? Sure, of course. You know, I mean, there are people in very one-sided friendships that, uh, you know, one usually takes more than the other one uh, does. But typically, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, and I see that uh, Dick Kemper uh, just joined. So uh, Dick was my coach originally back in middle school football uh, when I was, I don't know what, Dick, uh, eight, uh, well, like 13, 14. So, um, you know, really uh, that's, that, that, feeling of camaraderie and team and friendship really came from some of those early interactions. And I really thank Dick for that. And I'm glad you logged in today. Thanks, Dick. But, uh, you know, it's one of those kind of things where uh, you have to be a friend in order to have a friend or make a friend. And I think that a lot of people look at friendships and, and relationships in general as you know, what can you do for me? You know, what can I, what am I going to get out of it? And uh, I think a lot of people uh, take from a relationship often more than they give to it. And I think that it's important to, uh, give freely, uh, in a friendship and, uh, and frankly in, uh, in most relationships. And I think that, uh, one of the things that we see, uh, in terms of the imbalance in, in most of these opportunities is just the fact that, um, you know, it's often very one-sided and I think that that gets to be kind of unfortunate. And, uh, so, uh, you know, my number one, you know, recommendation, and I've got like 14 things here. So, uh, and you're welcome to ask questions and I'll circle back and get through, uh, the questions as we go through here. But, um, the number one thing is, uh, in, in order to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And I think that that's a really key, uh, notion. And, uh, and thanks, Dick, actually something you taught me early on. So it's hard to believe. So, uh, you know, I will be 56 this year. And that was when I was a lesson that Dick taught me when I was 14. So, you know, that would be 42 years ago. So um, unbelievable. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, it's a lesson that I learned to apply really too late in life. I mean, I really learned throughout my 40s and probably once I turned 50. I think really the thing for me was... Uh, I had a 40th birthday party planned 
Uh, and my father passed away a couple weeks before my uh, my 40th birthday. And unfortunately, nobody was really kind of in the mood for a party. Uh, and so I put it off to the next big milestone, which was my 50th birthday, which my wife helped organize and a lot of friends and other people involved in the process. Uh, it was well attended, people coming from hundreds of miles away and things like that. It was really wonderful. I mean, it, it really... But, you know, when you turn 50, you really start thinking back on some of those things. And, you know, I really began to apply that uh, when I turned 50. And so the last six years has really been me really understanding more about uh, what that's like. So in order to have a friend, you have to be a friend. Uh, and, um, and I think you have to stop worrying about what's in it for me. You have to focus on... Uh, on supporting the relationship, supporting the friendship, being there, and then hopefully, uh, you know, it it evens out. I mean, not every relationship is, you know, quid pro quo, you know, status quo, whatever. You know, it's it's like it's not tit for tat. There's not one thing than another. Ice cold water in a solo cup. Mm. Ah, very good. So, anyway, um, so I think that's what the. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that um, uh, really was an early lesson uh, that I learned. And I'll, I'll tell you how that came about and, and, uh, as we move forward here. So, um, I'll actually, I'll tell you now. So, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010. And uh, she had um, uh, two different types of breast cancer, actually. Uh, what is it? Uh, invasive lobular carcinoma and carcinoma in situ. So two different types of aggressive breast cancer. And, um, you know, when she began posting on social media that she had been diagnosed with cancer, uh, you know, a lot of her friends, and I use that term extremely loosely, friends, um, decided that, you know what, I'm not going to watch you die on social media. So good luck. You know, you seem like you have lots of, uh, good support systems in place and things like that. I mean, the messages you wouldn't believe. I mean, most of them were very positive, but the but the ironic part about that was, oh, it looks like you have plenty of people supporting you, so I'm not going to stick around. And, you know, the fact that you would know somebody for 20, 30 years, and then a good friend of yours ends up with cancer, and you are going to decide... Well, you have enough people worried about you. Mm, I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't really want to be confronted with any of that stuff. That's a little too much for me. So unfortunately, my wife lost about a third of her friends, you know, some childhood friends, some college friends, some other friends. And, uh, you know, so again, we're talking about what it takes to be a friend. And, you know, when somebody comes down with uh, a serious illness, like my wife did with cancer, uh, you would think that people would be more sympathetic, more supportive, more, uh, and I got news for you. If you're a friend of mine and I've known you for whatever time, you tell me you've got something going on, man, I'm, I'm there for you. You know, it's all good. You know, I don't care what it takes, but you know, for me, uh, you have to be a friend, uh, in order to have a friend. And when you've, when, you know, when something like being diagnosed with cancer, like my wife had comes up and you lose about a third of your friends, man, that's a real litmus test on whether or not they were friends of yours to begin with or not. I mean, that's fucked up, you know, and so it took a long time for her to really kind of recover from that betrayal by her, by her friends. And so, so let's talk a little bit more about what, you know, what it takes to be a friend. I'm getting a question on YouTube that says, what do I look for in a friend? And we're going to get to that. So, um, so number two on my list here is the best friends I ever had. I made in elementary school. And so there's a reason for that. You know, I've been thinking about this all day in the last couple of days as I've been kind of getting ready for this broadcast. And um, so it's interesting because um, for me, when you're young and you're a kid, you don't really kind of have a whole lot of, you haven't, you haven't impose the number of external factors on your friendships. You're, you, you have, you know, it's like, it's like my dogs. So, you know, my dogs have a great sense, you know, somebody comes to the house, you know, they either, you know, I like them, you know, and, and it could be the guy working on the HVAC. It could be anything, anybody. Uh, and, uh, but somebody comes to the house that they don't like, you know, you got to wonder why the fuck are you here? I mean, you know, it's like you've got, you know, they're clearly able to sense certain things about uh, people. And so for me, 
uh, I think in elementary school, I think you you develop that ability, that judgment, that early sense of of what really is a friend, you know, what makes a friend? Because it's pretty black and white. It's pretty binary. You know, are, are you bullying me? Are you teasing me? Are you a pain in the ass? Are you, you know, nice to me and things like that? And so I think that some of the most enduring friendships that I've made have been uh, from my elementary school days. And, and I count Eric Polig and Charles Moorhead and Chris Thurman and a bunch of other people that are, you know, in that group. I love you guys. I mean, you know, it's, and, you know, even people that I went to school with in elementary school, like Marilee Williams and, and, um, uh, and Barbara and Betsy Fitzgerald and a bunch of other people. I mean, in, um, you know, Christina and Bethany Mills, you know, all of, you know, and it didn't matter. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't boys and versus the girls or anything like that. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't any complex, uh, you know, relationship type stuff involved in that. It's just who was decent and who was good and things like that. And so, you know, I love that. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, when, when you go to elementary school and you're, you got five years, it's the most time you've got, you've got, or actually six years now. So you got kindergarten to fifth grade. That six years is almost as much time as you have in the three years in middle school and the four years in high school. So that's seven years. And you have six years from kindergarten to elementary school that if you're lucky, you get to hang out with those same people for literally half your school life. And that's important. I think that's really important. And so, plus you have a much better sense of that. Now, some shit happens in middle school. So, you know, middle school, things get a little more clickish. People are developing at different levels. They're developing mentally. They're developing, you know, physically. Uh, and things tend to shift a little bit more. And so, and then you get to high school and, you know, I, I don't know that it was any different back in my day, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the fucking earth. But the, the reality, though, is that in high school, uh, you know, today, uh, I mean, you know, the competition between people, uh, the, the absolute brutality of these friendships, you know, I mean, I mean, and, and I'm sorry, but you, you women are the worst. I mean, you know, it's like you'll backstab one of your BFFs, you know, and, you know, or it's like your hair sucks, your, 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 you know, your outfit sucks, you know, you, you look like shit, you know, your, you know, whatever, your hairstyle's horrible, you know, it, it, whatever. I mean, it's like, goddamn. I mean, you know, first of all, you know, women should be helping other women uh, succeed in this world. There's no reason to be at each other. You know, it's not that goddamn competitive. You know, Robbie on the football team isn't worth all this bullshit. So don't fucking do, don't play into that shit. You know, you can bang Robbie and then later on Robbie will be banging your BFF. Don't worry about it. You know, it just is not worth the relationship between the two of you. So, you know, that progression between elementary school, which is really a sort of a pure relationship kind of thing, middle school, they still keep the boys and girls a little separate, especially in health uh, class. And, and then, you know, in high school, things get really competitive. And that competitive, uh, you know, agenda is bullshit. You know, that is just the worst thing for friendships. It's like, it gets clickish and it gets, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, where are we going to college? You know, okay, well, so all the East Carolina girls, you're all going over here. All the JMU girls, you're all going over here. Uh, all the guys going to UVA, all the guys going to Virginia Tech, you know, you're all there over here. So, you know, it starts to organize itself into these things that are going to be sort of post K through 12 and usually aligns around college. You have your college friends, then you have your work friends and so on. So, but, you know, understand this, you know, the, the benefit of your elementary school friendships, you know, if you manage to maintain them, which I have thankfully managed to maintain some of them, uh, really are among the best relationships in the world. They really are. Uh, because you were a good judge of character back then. You knew exactly what you were getting your ass into. And you knew that, you know, Bobby or Cindy or whoever was a good person. And, you know, they may have turned out to be a bullshit person later on in life. And, and you may have chosen not to continue to be friends with them. But for the time being, you know, it's like, okay, great. Congratulations. I mean, you know, they were a good friend. So anyway, so that's, that's kind of uh, my perspective on, uh, on the elementary school side.
All right, so uh, number three, we talked about high school friends a little bit. Uh, again, it gets very competitive, and uh, it starts to get very cliquish and, uh, and things like that. The next category is really work friends. You know, once you get through college, you have your college friends, and, you know, a lot of times college friends are organized around uh, sororities or fraternities or other activities, uh, or your major, you know, you're in, you're in engineering or you're in psychology or you're in whatever, and, um, and you have friends that are part of a specific um, curriculum or, or, or extracurricular activity or something like that. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I think that college itself uh, becomes even sort of more concentrated. I mean, you have a lot more people, but you tend to gravitate towards your sort of security system, your own sort of built-in group. And, um, and I think that's important. Um, so once you graduate, I mean, cause you're only in college for four years and once you graduate, you know, you end up getting a job and then you have friends in the workplace and, and things like that. And, and workplace friends is, is difficult. I mean, you know, the, the hardest thing is, is that, and this is kind of a dynamic, I've just realized I'm not wearing a watch. Oh my God. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, so the the one thing problem with workplace uh, relationships and friendships is that you know the dynamics are so difficult these days because um, you know with all the you know sexual harassment lawsuits and stuff like that going on, it becomes very difficult to um, you know to sustain uh, close friendships in a work environment uh, you know where something may be misconstrued and and things like that. So you have to be careful and. Um, but, you know, uh, you're going to be spending, you know, if you think about it, uh, you typically spend six to eight hours sleeping. You spend eight to ten hours a day at work. And the balance of that time, you know, is going to be something like six hours, six to eight hours in commuting and dinner and things like that. So if you have a wife or a girlfriend or things like that, then you're going to spend majority of your time, you know, a, a significant majority, maybe 40 percent or more, you know, even 50 percent in some days. Um, you know, at work and, and those work relationships, those work friendships become something that you inevitably, uh, spend more time with. I mean, in, in a lot of cases, people aren't spending more than four hours a day with their wife or girlfriend. Uh, and, um, they're spending eight to 12 hours a day, uh, with, you know, they even have a term for it. They're talking about their work wife versus their, uh, versus their actual wife. I mean, you know, if there's a term for it, there's a pretty good chance that, uh, you know, it's something that, um, you know, that you should pay attention to. So, uh, so that's it, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, friends at work, I think you just have to be careful, uh, with that. But again, I think your elementary school friends are the best friends you're going to have. I think that, uh, your high school friends, you know, is where it begins to get a little clickish, uh, as you head towards college and then college further, I think stratifies and segments people. And, um, and then when you get to work, uh, I think you spend more time with your work friends than you do with people outside of work. So you have to be careful just in terms of, uh, getting a proper work-life balance. All right. So, uh, the next thing is, uh, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, same sex and opposite sex friends. Uh, now if you're a guy and you have same sex friends, which is other guys, uh, then typically you spend time, you know, where I'm going out with the guys. Okay. Well, that's great. You know, and, and hanging with the guys and, um, the, um, and so it's an interesting, uh, you know, situation, I think, especially in your twenties and early thirties, late, you know, eight in your mid to late twenties, all the way up till, you know, your early thirties. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting uh, that you um, that guys when they're going to guys' night out or things like that, even when they're in a relationship. I think the thing that is is kind of bizarre for me uh, is uh, when people will decide they're going to get married or they're going to they have a fiance or they have a girlfriend that lives with them or things like that. Is that you know on a Friday night they're going to go out with their boys. And so, you know, that's kind of tough, man. You know, it's like, you know, you just left your wife, girlfriend, you know, whatever, uh, at home, you know, and, uh, unless she's going out with her friends too, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, but, um, you know, I mean, there's so many different, uh, things that <clears throat> whether you're taking in sporting events or you're just, you know, hanging out, doing whatever, uh, you know, a group of guys, uh, you know, always can find something to do. You know, it, it's those kind of friendships that I really did enjoy uh, when I was in college. 
you know, a bunch of friends that are, uh, you know, that were a bunch of guys, uh, and we hung out and played games and did various things. And, and, uh, it was, we were never bored. We'd stay up till three o'clock in the morning, uh, doing different, you know, just hanging out, you know, doing whatever. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, I think we, we really kind of, the guys don't have a whole lot of requirements, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's like you could be doing whatever. And, and that was fine. So, and, and, I'm, and I will say this, so I'll move on to, you know, same sex friends for girls and groups of girls. Uh, you know, I'm not a girl. I don't, you know, I don't play one on TV. Uh, I do know uh, a number of people who have shared with me, uh, that, um, you know, they, um, they find that, uh, that their female friends, uh, is, um, you know, they end up having a closer relationships. And I think that's probably true. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I've seen people, you know, in high school or whatever, uh, that post on social media where they're, you know, they're doing a sleepover and they're doing each other's hair and they're doing each other's nails. And they're doing facials and stuff like that. And that's great. I mean, I think that, you know, it builds that relationship between these group of girls and, um, I think as long as they're not competing for the same boys in, in the relationship department, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's one of those kind of things that's, uh, you know, that, that can be very healthy. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I do find that I think that, uh, from at least the, the women that I know that are, you know, in the 18 to 29 range, uh, that I've talked to about other things, they seem to be better focused on, uh, the quality of the relationships that they have, uh, and they have m maybe more standards as well as more m uh, more parameters on their friendships, and so uh, and I think they tend to have better friendships in some cases because of that. Uh, and um, but usually it's interesting. So it seems to be uh, the dynamic for for groups of women appear to be that one is always more dominant than the other. Uh, and, uh, and one, you know, and, and, and one or more of the others are more accommodating. And so, you know, it, it's how the group dynamic is, is kind of affected. The interesting thing about the friendship thing at that point is when they're out enjoying, you know, a night at the club and things like that, uh, you know, the more aggressive, more dominant women that lead the group are really kind of in charge of kind of setting the tone and the pace for the group uh, for that evening. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, at least from what I've seen in what people post and in the responses and comments and things like that, it's interesting that um, uh, some of the guys are actually attracted to uh, the more submissive, more reserved, more uh, introverted uh, women in the group, as opposed to the more dominant ones, which they probably are a little intimidated by. Uh, and, uh, which is funny because the, the dominant ones are the ones that are out there kind of putting themselves out there, making the contacts. And of course, you know, most groups of women that are out somewhere don't need somebody to make contacts for them, but you know, it's, uh, there's plenty of traffic, you know, so, but it's an interesting dynamic. It, it seems to affect the group dynamic of that friend group. And, uh, so that same sex friend group gets, um, a lot more complicated, uh, when, um, when they're competing for other males uh, in the in the vicinity, so interesting thing. All right, so let's talk about, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to all the questions. I see I get a, getting a bunch of questions. Uh, thanks, AJ, for uh, you know on YouTube. I'll get back to those here in a minute. I'm going to just finish my list here. So uh, opposite sex friends. So if you're a guy, and um, well, I'll do girls. So first, so opposite sex friends. If you're a girl. Uh, and you have multiple guys, there's a good chance that your boyfriend is not going to be all that supportive of you having a bunch of guy friends. And uh, I have been in that predicament myself. Now, when I was in college, uh, it was me and two other guys and 27 girls in our studio. Just the luck of the draw. And, um, and I made the choice early on to not uh, date any of them. Uh, and, uh, I decided to be friends with all of them because I figured they had friends and, uh, a strategy that actually worked out pretty well, frankly. But, um, the, um, you know, the other two, one decided to date one girl, one decided to date as many of the 27 as he could. I think he got up to like six or eight. So, uh, you know, whatever, that's his thing. But, uh, when all of those girls got, uh, a boyfriend, 
uh, almost all of them, and this is before social media and before phones and things like that. This is in the late eighties. Uh, you know, they were prohibited by their boyfriend from, you know, hanging out with me and, and things like that because their boyfriend felt threatened. And so it was an interesting dynamic to be sure. Uh, and I think it's one of those kind of things that, uh, very weak, very insecure men, uh, you know, or boys, uh, will, um, put, you know, limitations or parameters on their girlfriends, uh, that, you know, limit the number of guy friends they can have, you know, and, um, so I think that's an, you know, an interesting and unfortunate kind of situation, but the reality is, is that it is what it is. I mean, you know, I'm, I wasn't a threat to anybody. If I wanted to sleep with his girlfriend, I would have done it months ago, long before he came along. Uh, and, um, so, uh, if you're a guy, uh, and you have lots of other female friends, uh, there aren't many people, uh, is, um, you know, not, not many people are going to you know, want you to continue your relationship with, uh, with some of the female friends as well. And, and so, you know, I had a number of female friends when I was in, in college and I dated a number of girls as well. And, uh, I know that when I dated some of those girls, they were really kind of, um, they were kind of, uh, uh, not reluctant, not resistant, uh, resentful, of my, my great relationship with my friends, uh, that were part of my studio class. And, you know, it had nothing to do with how good our relationship was or our friend, you know, my, my relationship, those friendships, I guess, were still seen as potentially, uh, competing and they weren't, they never were, but, uh, for a lot of guys, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't keep them from that, but, uh, but control, I think controlling your girlfriend's access to her friends, uh, especially your guy friends is never really going to work. I mean, they may agree to that for a short period of time, but they're not really going to put up with that shit, you know, indefinitely. So, but opposite sex friends is just very hard. I think anytime you're in a relationship, I think they tend to want to make sure that, you know, uh, they maintain their relationships, but in most cases their op, their partner in the relationship really doesn't, doesn't see that as a positive thing. Hmm. I think that if your girlfriend or boyfriend is going to cheat on you, they're going to cheat on you no matter what. And I don't think that it's, it matters whether you limit their access to their friends or not. So I don't think that has anything to do with that. Okay. So, um, number 10 is, uh, BFFs and the friend hierarchy. So this is by far my favorite. So, uh, you know, I had a friend group in college, the two guys that I, were the, I was the closest with, and the, the three of us, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, had different relationships with each other in terms of our friendships, and there was, you know, different dynamics and things like that, but we were all three really good friends. Um, I find it interesting when, especially for women, uh, who, oh, this person's my BFF. Well, you know, the problem is, is that the person who is next in lower in the hierarchy, she likely thought she was your BFF. And I think that that dynamic is pretty interesting. So the idea that, you know, they think they're, or they should be, it's like, I've done more for you than she has. Fuck her. What does she know? You know, I, I love how contentious the relationships are in these relationship hierarchies with, uh, with the BFF tag. So, um, I think that's kind of interesting. And, um, so, uh, and this spills over into the next one, which is wedding and marriage. So God help you. If you're putting together the bridal party and you have to figure out who your maid of honor or matron of honor is, uh, you know, which one of your bridesmaids is going to have the higher status than everybody else. That is a fucking shit show. There is nobody I've seen who's had a, a friend group that, you know, that worked out well. I mean, it's, it played out, I think, in Sex and the City and a bunch of other sitcoms and other stuff like that. I mean, it's a common dynamic and it's real. It's really real. It hurts the feelings of the people who are second or third in your friend group uh, because, that other person that you put in charge, uh, is somehow higher than they are, even though they don't always feel that that's the case. So, uh, so that BFF, that best friend forever, uh, moniker that you put on somebody, uh, man, it, you know, if, if there are multiple people in your friend group and everybody else thinks that they're your BFF, 
man, that can, that just fucking sucks. I mean, that is, that is hilarious. It, it's funny to watch because it's, uh, it's amazing to me, um, how people, um, sort of jockey for position in that friend hierarchy, uh, where they want to be your BFF, where they thought they were, you know, they were your BFF and they find out that they're not. And, uh, I think that's unfortunate. I mean, I think that it really leads to, uh, the kind of contentious relationships that ultimately end up breaking up the friendship. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, I've seen that a couple times, uh, over the years. So let's see, we talked about wedding and marriage. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, people have asked me a couple of times, they're like, so, you know, what is your recommendation? Uh, you know, I've been married 22 years. Uh, they're like, you know, what's your recommendation for, you know, for marriage? And, uh, my best recommendation is you should marry your BFF. And, and literally, I mean, uh, you know, I'm very lucky. I met my wife 22 years ago. Uh, we've been through a lot in the last 22 years, ups and downs, and that's great. And, uh, but you know, we've never stopped being there for each other. And I think that's one of the things that has been, uh, one of the greatest things about being married for 22 years. And I think that, you know, people who've been married three years, I mean, I was married for three years. She was married for three years twice before. So, um, you know, I think if you, if you're not where you want to be in the relationship and the marriage within like three years, then I think you need to get out of it. I mean, I just don't think it's not going to get any better. So don't waste any more time. I, I know a lot of people who should have gotten out at year three and say they should have, and they stayed till year seven, uh, you know, just because they're putts. But, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, look, you're not getting any younger. It's not going anywhere. It's not going where you want it to go. So if it's not, you know, if it's not ideal, I think you should just get the fuck out. And, um, but I think the real secret is to, you know, marry somebody who, uh, is literally your best friend. And, uh, and that's really worked out. And it's interesting because that's, you know, the kind of wedding and marriage, uh, you know, number 12 on my list is marry your best friend friend. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that's important because eventually, I mean, you know, when you're in your sixties or seventies or eighties or stuff like that, a lot of the other stuff becomes less important. Uh, and it really comes down to, you know, do you enjoy spending time with each other? Are you really there for each other and things like that? So again, that friendship component is important. I mean, in, in any marriage, you know, you really literally, as you transition from your elementary school friends and your middle school friends and your high school friends and your college friends and your work friends, and so on, as you begin to build a relationship in that, in that continuum, you need to focus on, uh, marrying your best friend. I mean, I think that really is, uh, you know, and I think that's why it's so important to be friends first. I mean, it's, it's, you can't just have, you know, a fuck buddy that you like to have sex with that, you know, then you want to marry. I mean, that just really doesn't kind of work. Uh, and so, um, which really kind of gets me to, um, the idea of, uh, adult friends and, and also, uh, I mean, no discussion of friends would be complete without friends with benefits. So, uh, you know, I think that in this day and age, I mean, friends with benefits is a common kind of nomenclature in the, in society. And I think that, again, if you marry your best friend, I think that's, that's the ideal way to go. Uh, but you know, I think you have to, um, really show up for, uh, for that as well. And I think that you, uh, you have to feed the relationship and feed the friendship and, and things like that. Uh, in terms of friends with benefits, uh, at least for me, uh, you know, I've, I've not, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that just gets into, you know, uh, an opportunity to just have a physical relationship. I mean, for me, I have to have a spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and then physical, uh, connection with somebody. So I think when you cre you have to be free. You have to like the person. You have to be friends with the person. And uh, for a lot of people, that's just not true. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, for people, their various friend groups, uh, you know, have a very diverse uh, range of possibilities. But uh, at least for me, it, it's not been something that I've been, uh, I've been fond of, uh, you know, uh, in, throughout my lifetime. So, uh, and adult friends are interesting. So, you know, people mature at different rates and things like that. And I have some friends that are in their late forties that still act like they're in their early twenties. Like it's like life is still some frat party. And I just don't think that that's very productive. I mean, I just don't think that, um, that that's conducive to, 
uh, you know, some people just never grow up. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I don't think that that, um, I, I think that's hard on the friendship in order to continue to kind of deal with that. So, but anyway, so that is the 14 items that I had. We're about 35 minutes in. So let me look at the questions that we've got. Again, we're talking about friends and friendship. And uh, we talked about, um, you know, the whole continuum between starting in elementary school and middle school, high school, college, work friends, uh, life and relationships, uh, same-sex friends, as well as opposite-sex friends, and uh, and BFFs and wedding and marriage and, and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, and I, I really do appreciate the people who contributed, uh, you know, the, uh, the concepts for this. If you have thoughts and for other future videos, let me know, put them in the comments. But uh, let me take a look and see what some of these questions have been. Um, I'll take Instagram first, since you're going to cut out first. The, um, how common is that type of behavior? Uh, controlling a girlfriend's access to friends. I think it's pretty common. I mean, uh, you know, I, I hear, I see people post all the time on Instagram, especially, uh, that their, uh, their boyfriend, uh, is, uh, is not really very happy with, um, you know, the fact that this, their girlfriend is very popular and has a lot of followers, you know, in some of these cases, I've seen some of these guys post, you know, creepy shit you know, on somebody's, uh, you know, thing too. I mean, you know, if, if, if your girlfriend is in her twenties and you got some guys in their sixties posting shit, you know, I mean, you got to kind of wonder, you know, if it's really worth it, you know, in terms of just the exposure that, you know, that your girlfriend's getting, but, uh, but no, I think it's fairly common. All right, let's go over to YouTube here. We got a bunch of questions. Uh, what do I look for in a friend? I, you know, I look for people that are as good as their word. I mean, I think that's important. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll address this in the body of the episode. Uh, the advert of, so of social media has blurred the parameters of what is a friend. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I think the, um, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, thanks AJ. Uh, you know, I think people believe that they're, that they're friends and I don't think that people pretty much act like friends all the time. Uh, I've been taking advantage of by friends. Uh, I've been genuine, always put forth, uh, the best effort to demonstrate things like reliability concern. I've come to appreciate my own company, uh, to, uh, douchebags. Yeah, no, uh, I got one. I appreciate that. I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, you have to be a friend to make a, to have a friend, but you know, if you're being friends to people who really don't respect or appreciate the effort that you're making, then I don't think that there's a lot of opportunity to continue with that. There's no, certainly no requirement to continue. Um, how do you feel about people satisfied with their own solitude compared to the more extroverted charismatic people? Well, you know, I have a lot of friends that uh, are heavy on the uh, introvert scale and they're very intelligent. I enjoy their company, uh, but I think it's fine. I mean, I think if you, you know, but I think people need friends though. I think you need somebody other than yourself. Have you had any friends who've stabbed you in the back? Uh, yeah, Javier, I have. I mean, I had, you know, friends that I've, you know, been in business with and things like that, that uh, unfortunately have proven themselves uh unworthy of either my friendship or the opportunity to work with them. So, uh, it's unfortunate, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm way too trusting of most people and I try to make that a strength. Uh, but you know, unfortunately not everybody is, uh, as attentive to the friendship as I am. I found workplace friendships can be tricky because much of the camaraderie and appreciation you develop is transactional you help each other uh, achieve company goals, and there's a sense of bonding. Yeah, I think that's true, AJ. Yep. However, once these circumstances change and somebody's utility drops off, the friendship is more likely to be compromised as opposed to a friend whom you're willing to support through thick and thin. I think you're exactly right, AJ. I think people, like I said, I, I started out the session talking about the fact that people use other people, you know, for the most part, which is unfortunate because it's really not necessary. Uh, but that says more about them than anything else, but, uh, for sure. Uh, Gordon, I've always avoided, uh, friending, uh, in the workplace. I have always 
uh, out of my own insecurity felt you cannot allow people to become too familiar. Uh, you have to make people feel okay with avoidance. Uh, let's see. Do you have to make people feel okay with avoidance? Uh, well, Godwin, you know, no, not necessarily. I mean, I think in order to be successful in the workplace, I think you have to be a team player. I think they're looking for people who uh, gets the plays nice with others checkbox. And so, you know, you may be uh, cutting off some of your own opportunities, but, you know, you're allowed to do that. I mean, uh, but, you know, I mean, I think that uh, it's important to develop friendships in the workplace. You know, I think it's, uh, it's important. Uh, dominant men tend to prefer prefer submissive women and more beta men prefer women uh, who wear the pants. I don't know if that's true, AJ. I mean, I, I think that uh, at least for me, I mean, I'm about as alpha male as it comes, uh, you know, uh, type A personality, uh, ENTJ. And so for me, um, you know, I actually prefer uh, really strong uh, women uh, I, you know, I, I've referred to them recently as alpha females, and uh, I think we have a lot of alpha females in the current society, and uh, it's exciting to see uh, women taking control of opportunities in their life and their career and their education and things like that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. So, yeah. Uh, if you're going to throttle your girlfriend's access to friends and social involvement in general, all of those details need to be hammered out before uh, any sort of commitment or expectations in advance. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, um, you know, AJ, I, I, I don't know that you sit down and have a negotiation uh, with them, you know, about that. But I do think that um, I, I would recommend to guys that you don't try to act, you know, restrict their access. Uh, I think all that does is make them want to violate that restriction even more. And uh, I don't think that's pretty, I don't think it's very positive uh, in the, uh, in the long run. I mean, it, it may work in the short term, but those relationships tend to last six to nine months, maybe 12 to 18 months at the outside, but the restrictions eventually become not worth the hassle. And so I think that you'll find that relationships are much more short lived. And uh, if, if it's something you want to be involved in in the long term, then I think it's something that you have to consider. But um, so um, Godwin says that, uh, you know, he also likes strong women. Well, Godwin, you're also more passive male. So, of course, you're going to like stronger women. So uh, I don't think control creates a very genuine relationship. Well, William, you're exactly right. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, um, uh Godwin, you can go ahead and, and just post it right here. I'll uh, or you can DM me uh, or put it in the comments. But uh, if you uh, if you want to go ahead and tell me what the topic is, I'll remind myself to take a look at it. But uh, you're exactly right, William. Uh, on Instagram, uh, I don't think control creates a genuine relationship at all. I think it 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 violates the basic foundation of what a relationship really is, and I don't think that that's the intent at all. So um, I would not. Uh, I, I would resist doing that. Uh, and, um, either you trust the person or you don't. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, if they're trustworthy, then they're going to be trustworthy. If they're not, then they're not. So, uh, no amount of restrictions or, or ultimatums or stuff like that is going to make any difference. So, uh, if it did, then the Maury Povich show and a bunch of other, you know, uh, and, and Steve Wilkos and Jerry Springer, those shows would have nobody to come on. So, so anyway, all right. So, um, we have about 15 minutes left and it's date night tonight. So I get to take my wife of 22 years, uh, out to dinner. And, um, so, uh, I gotta grab a quick shower, maybe even shave and, um, and get dressed into something more appropriate for dinner. But, uh, so we're going to stop right at the end mark at one hour. So we have, uh, about another 15 minutes. If you've got anything, that's great. Um, uh, Godwin, if you've got, uh, the comment that you wanted or whatever the topic was, let me know. So, and I will be glad to address it now if you want. 
Let's see, there was another question. Let me see what the other question was. Somebody had posted something to me in DM on Instagram. Let me see what it was. So a couple things, um, you know, so one of the things that I wanted to, um, I wanted to address, uh, is, um, uh, there, if you are going to reach out to me via Instagram, please understand that, uh, you know, I, I just don't have an opportunity to chat with people. Uh, if you've got a topic you want me to cover, I'm happy to cover it in the videos during the live, live at fives. Uh, but you know, don't DM me and, try to get me into Forex trading or Bitcoin or some other bullshit scam thing you've got going on. Don't waste my time. Don't hit on me for God's sake. Don't ask me for money. Don't ask me for, to review an idea. You know, I'm not interested in any of that, you know, so, uh, it just ends up, you know, having me block you. So uh, I will say that, uh, one of the comments that I got, which was, which I did reply to, uh, which is kind of interesting is the idea that, um, uh, was the role of artificial intelligence in, um, in society and in business and things like that. And, you know, right now we use AI for, um, in cars, uh, to try and determine, you know, the self-driving cars and things like that. And the opportunity to be able to create, um, different strategies for companies that, uh, utilize advice, uh, that is on, based on, some expert system. And it's an interesting opportunity. I mean, I think that, you know, I won't give the details of that because, um, Brock was, uh, was really very good about, um, you know, about that. And I, I don't want to give away in case he wants to do it, but, um, it was a very interesting idea. I think, I think we're going to see AI used in lots of different ways. So, um, uh, what would be a red flag that you look for in a potential relationship? I, I think dishonesty. I mean, I think that, or, or inattentiveness, actually. Uh, you know, if you send them a text message and you don't hear back in 24 hours, uh, I, I think, you know, and it just depends. I mean, you know, I, the expectation has, has been recently that if you don't hear back from them in 15 minutes, then, you know, there's something wrong. But, I mean, people have lives and people are, you know, not always tied to their phones and stuff like that. But if you don't hear back from somebody in 24 to 48 hours, uh, I think that's a pretty good indication that there's really just something not, not going, going properly in that. I mean, they're not making you a priority. So, um, let's see here. So Godwin has, uh, I would like to have you address the idea of, uh, reparations relative uh, to relatives of slaves in America. I appreciate your insights and would like to know if you believe, uh, anything should, uh, should like, should, should this look like? Um, so I, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the idea of reparations. I, I, you know, I don't think that, uh, um, I'm just not going to comment on that. You know, I, it's, it's not something that I'm prepared to, uh, to share. Um, you know, I mean, we, we have had, uh, I did this math for everybody the other day. I mean, uh, the first slave ship was in 1619 in, in, in the new world. Uh, and, uh, somebody had said that 15 something was the first slave ship down in Florida where, um, at St. Augustine, Florida could have been, uh, it, but you know, my family came in in 1618, the year before slaves were brought in, uh, here in Virginia and the new world. Um, so, uh, you know, we didn't have any slaves when we came over, but, uh, the, um, I, I'm not going to get into, you know, uh, reparations. I mean, the, the time from 1619, to, uh, 1961 for the civil war or 1861 for the civil war, 
you know, I mean, there was a lot of, of turmoil in that. I have a whole other video on, on racism and, and the history of all that and everything. Uh, you're welcome to take a look at that. But uh, we, did, we didn't make a lot of progress from 1865 all the way to 1968. Uh, and so 100 years of really no progress when progress was really kind of mandated. And that's unfortunate. You know, I think that uh, especially on Juneteenth here, uh, which I think is a stupid name too, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, finally the end of slavery two years after it was originally uh, signed into law, uh, you know, which is unfortunate. I mean, it, it took a while for the Emancipation Proclamation to be endorsed in various states, and uh, Texas was the last to adopt it. So, um, you know, I, I just think that uh, we're at a point in our society where, um, you know, everybody should be equal. And I think that... Um, there should be no issue with skin color. Uh, I do, I will say this, that I think that, um, you know, the police force here in the United States receives some of the least amount of training any of any police force anywhere in the country or any, anywhere in the world, that most other major police forces that have no problem with, you know, these types of issues uh, have as much as three years of training before you can become a police officer. And, um I think that's really what it comes down to. I think we need better screening. I think we need better uh, training. I think we need a lot of things uh, in order to help um, manage uh, this this relationship uh, between society and the police. Uh, and it's not just a black or white issue. I mean, there's you know plenty of dumbass redneck motherfuckers that get shot by police too. But I'm not gonna not justifying one or the other. I'm I'm not gonna say all lives matter. You know. Because I understand that disproportionately, uh, the people in the black community are are harmed by that activity, uh, you know, on a regular basis. So uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that, you know. So, but um, so anyway, uh, let me see what the other comment was here. All right. Uh, to clarify, the premise behind my text is that commitment should not be taken lightly when you uh, commit your signing off on everything about the other person. So attempting to be controlling during the relationship is bad. Each partner may have exceptions that, in, that entail types of limits uh, as terms of the relationship essentially to be completely on the same page. Yeah, AJ, I get that, man. But I mean, you're not going to have her sign a 15-page, you know, performance contract. You know, it just doesn't work that way, man. So, oh yeah, speaking of AI, how do you uh, feel self-driving cars will affect real estate market in urban centers? Uh, well, we'll talk about that later. Um, let's see, fair enough. Is it true that Europeans were the most technologically advanced civilization in the time they landed in the new world. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know if they're the most technologically advanced or not. I mean, you know, they were, my ancestors came from Germany through, or what is present day Germany, uh, through uh, Scotland and England, uh, mostly Scotland. Uh, my middle name is Glazebrook, which the clan Glazebrook is from the highlands of Scotland. And, um, so, um, I mean, there were other people in, uh, in the Germanic world or, uh, in the Roman world and in, even in parts of Egypt that had been around for thousands of years before all that, uh, I think that were probably much more advanced. I mean, we built thatched huts for God's sake, you know, here in, in the new world and, uh, the Romans and other people had built amazing structures out of stone. So to think that, you know, the dumbasses that landed on the, uh, you know, on the shores of Virginia here in the new world in, uh, in 1607 were, um, you know, were the most technologically advanced on the planet at the time. I don't think so. I mean, I'm, you know, if that were the case, then, you know, maybe they would have, um, you know, been a little further along, but, um, uh, cheers from Aberdeen, Scotland, you know, for sure. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. You know, I, I need to make a trip to. Uh, uh, so if you're uh, if you're on LinkedIn, uh, go to my link in my bio or to my website and link out to my uh, my LinkedIn. 
I'd love to connect. Um, I'd like to head to Scotland here uh, at some point and kind of reconnect with uh, with my uh, ancestral roots there. So I'm a huge Highlander fan. So mm. uh, let's see. What's my view on signing a prenup? So I got asked this question the other day about, you know, did I sign a prenup uh, and things like that? No, I didn't. And that's because I was broke as fuck at the time that, you know, I met my wife. So uh, I was struggling to make the company happen. I hadn't made my first million yet. I did make my first million shortly after I met my wife. So I guess if I was going to have a post up, I guess that would have been the time to do that. But uh, the... Um, but no, I mean, I I, uh, I owe much of my success to my wife uh, of the last 22 years. And if for some reason she wants to leave and take half, she's welcome to it. So it's hers and she earned it, uh, you know, and uh, so I got no problem with that. I think that prenups are actually a bad idea. I mean, uh, you know, if you've got a lot of assets to protect, then maybe so. But, you know, the idea that it's like, okay, look, if you hang in there for at least three to five years, you'll get $5 million and then you can go on your merry way or something like that. You know, I mean, that's great. But I mean, you know, there are people that will hang in there, you know, three years and one day to collect their $5 million check and then they're gone. You know, I mean, that's just, I, I think that it runs counterproductive to most of what people would expect as a, a, a positive influence in the relationship. So, but, um, anyway, so we got about four minutes left and, um, I, uh, I appreciate that. You know, I'm, uh, again, uh, I think that friendships are important. I, I will say this. So the one thing that I really have enjoyed about being on Quora for the last three years is really all the friends I've made. Uh, some of you know, which have migrated here. Some of uh, those of you that uh, I was uh, uh, able to, um, here, Yasmin, hang on a second. There we go. Thanks. I'll, uh, thanks, Yas. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add you on LinkedIn. So, um, oh, I'm already correct, connected. Great. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, some of the some of the most valuable friendships I've made uh, have been since being on Quora. Uh, and that's because of my friends like Ron Rule and other people that I've met on uh, Quora. Uh, I've really, I, I can't say enough uh, about just the quality of people and even the people who have followed me and the people who have, you know, gone to gordonmiller.com and, uh, and, you know, clicked on the booking uh, tab and booked a call and people that I've met and people that I've helped along the way, I really do enjoy and really appreciate that. I mean, I really, uh, I have a lot of love and respect for all of you and you, you all have made, uh, my life, uh, an enormous, uh, enormously richer, uh, you know, experience for that. So I appreciate that. I really do. And, uh, I appreciate you guys making the trip from, uh, Quora over here and, uh, in Instagram and in YouTube and uh, thank you all very much uh, for, you know, taking this journey with me. And, um, you know, I, um, I really do appreciate it. It's been fun. Uh, and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, Cora is still hell-bent on, uh, you know, paying everybody but the people who create content. And so that's kind of unfortunate. But, uh, you know, not much you can do about it. I mean, I'm not there. I'm not on Cora to make money anyway. I'm there to help people. So... Again, I'm really kind of focused on, uh, you know, making friends and helping people over the next uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, I appreciate that very much, actually. So uh, you guys are all great friends. Uh, I appreciate the support and, and everything else that uh, you guys have given. I appreciate you guys showing up for live at five. I'm sorry that it's been sort of off and on the last, uh, you know, parts of the week. If you have some thoughts or some, uh, some things to... Um, you know, uh, you know, topics you want to see me do, just put it in the comments and, uh, I'll make sure that I, uh, I get back to those and, uh, to everybody on YouTube, uh, AJ and, and Godwin and you guys, everybody on Instagram. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. And, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off about a minute early. You can always go to gordonmiller.com and, uh, uh, we're starting to post the answers there. I'm working with my editor now on the book that is coming out. And, 
Yeah, I see you, Karis. I don't have any more time left, man. I got a minute left. So, but, um, so anyway, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Peace out.